Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and I feel really honoured to be here today and to be talking to you about her work on sea turtles in the Chagos Archipelago. Uh, we're one year into a four-year project that's funded by the Bertrelli Foundation, so I'm going to talk to you about our initial results, some of the older work we've been doing, and then what we're planning in the next few years. And uh, this work, uh, so I'm from Swansea University, I'm working with Graham Hayes, who's based at Deakin University near Melbourne in Australia, and also Jean Mortimer, who is based in the Seychelles. Uh, we also have expanded our team to others not directly supported by the grant, but also uh, collaborating with us, so are able to add value to our work in uh, Chagos Archipelago. So first of all, I'm, talking, I'm going to present a little bit about the natural history of turtles in the Chagos Archipelago, as that informs and uh, details the work that we're doing. Uh, next, I'll talk a bit about the nuts and bolts of the biologging te bio technology that we're working with and that lies at the heart of our research. And finally, to, to present some of the results, uh, both at the breeding um, beaches and also uh, migration and foraging grounds. So this is a photo I took at, just as we were departing from Diego Garcia in July after a really successful three-week expedition there. And it shows you the dichotomy of habitats that are available for sea turtles to use in the archipelago. So Diego Garcia, like most of the other atolls, has a shallow uh, lagoon, which is, goes to depths of tens of metres and is shown by the, shallower, uh, by the lighter coloured water and uh, then has fringing reef uh, shown by the waves breaking there on the oceanic coast. And this provides two important habitats for sea turtles, both green turtles and hawksbill turtles that are in the archipelago. The lagoon provides developmental habitat for immature turtles, and then the beach on the oceanic side provides nesting beach for greens and hawksbills. So our work is involved with both uh, different, in both different habitats and with both species. And so at the heart of our work is to, uh, to investigate the patterns of movement of both of these species. So Graham's been working for over 25 years with satellite tags and has made all the mistakes, so I can come at a relatively late moment in time and benefit from the learning points and as we attach the go-to device that we use, which is the Splash 10 from Wildlife Computers, which is a fast lock GPS satellite tag, which remotely relays the GPS locations uh, to the Argos satellite network. And it provides really accurate locations to tens of meters. So we're able to have really fine movement data available from turtles that we've tag, uh, attached this tag to. And the benefits of this tag is it has a really flexible antenna uh, because unusually in, uh, in biot, uh, green turtles nest right under the vegetation. So we were looking for a model that has a flexible antenna that doesn't break when they go to nest under the vegetation. And it also has a really low profile, which is great for reducing the drag and also reducing damage to the tags. So I've just indicated on the, um, here, just where the tag is on an adult female that we're just equipped with the tag uh, on the beach in Jago Garcia. So perhaps the easiest way to, sh to explain the method that we use to attach tags is to show this short uh, video. Um, it's not quite up to the quality of previous videos, so sorry for the very shaky movements on board the uh, boat. Uh, and the video starts in, uh, at a study site in Australia with daytime tagging of an, uh, of an adult male green turtle. First of all, the carapace is clean to provide a very um, clean um, point of attachment for the tag, and we use this red epoxy resin to uh, provide a, an attachment um, and also to protect the top of the tag and provide protection uh, for where the turtle is going under overhangs. Um, and, uh, and we, stream, we um, tidy up the epoxy to, um, to provide streamlining. streamlining. 
Uh, and the red tape you see are to temporarily protect the really sensitive parts of the tag that we don't want to cover with epoxy during the attachment process. And lastly, we paint the tag with black anti-fouling paint. So that's to reduce the likelihood of epibiont settling on the tag and either affecting the ability of the tag's performance or um, increasing drag for the turtle. So once this procedure is finished, it takes about two hours, uh, and the epoxy and the antifouling paint is dry, we then release the turtle um, back into the water. So um, here we're uh, re releasing the adult male green into the water, and this is in Shark Bay in Australia. And then next we're going to move to nighttime attachment, uh, and so this is in Diego Garcia, uh, just recently on the expedition. And you can see that we've corralled the turtle into a box and we've put a damp t um, towel over her head to reduce the um, disturbance to her. And they essentially go to sleep during the attachment procedure. Uh, and then when, um, when we've finished and we lift the box off, they usually don't even notice, so we have to give them a bit of a nudge to... Um, push them off to go back to sea. So most turtles, green turtles nesting in biot are nesting at night time. Hawksbills are nesting in daytime. So we have an expedition planned shortly uh, and we're looking forward to being able to do more daytime work as opposed to nocturnal work. Okay, so what are these uh, tags telling us about the movements of turtles in Chagos Archipelago? Well, firstly, we looked at the breeding season, and this essentially is a heat map. So the red, so, so I've indicated with the arrow the tagging beach, and you can see that all of the movements are very close to the tagging beach, and the red zones are for 50% of the locations of turtles that we tagged in 2012, and the yellow zones are for... Um, so the red and yellow combined are for 90% of the locations. And we found, we were quite staggered at our findings that turtles are actually nesting up to 10 times on Diego Garcia before they leave for their foraging grounds. And they're nesting at, at two-week intervals, and uh, so they can be there for up to five months. So if you imagine that turtles laying about 10 uh, about 100 eggs in each clutch. So that's 1,000 eggs that they're laying before they leave. And so it's a massive investment in reproduction there. So this has broad implications for the estimation of turtle populations. Estimates are usually based on the numbers of um, the females, uh, nesting females in the population, because it's much, much easier to count females based on tracks that, uh, than go into the water and... Uh, count um, the turtles foraging in the area. So uh, foot patrols around the world have concluded that, that turtles are laying about two to three clutches per season, uh, and we found that there was an average of six clutches per, female, uh, per season. So if you do the maths and you have a foot patrol uh, counting 3,000 tracks along the beach in a season, and you apply three clutches per female, so you'll have a population of 1,000 um, um, females, whereas if you apply the new estimate of six clutches per female, so you have your 3,000 tracks divided by six, uh, you have an estimated population of 500 females. So, um, so that's led us to revise our census um, manuscript calculations, which is coming out shortly. Uh, and what about the destination at the end of the nesting season? Uh, so we all, Jean, Graham and myself, we all um, kind of had guesses about where the turtles might be going, uh, and we've all got considerable experience in turtle biology, um, Graham and Jean more than myself, um, but we were all wrong uh, in our estimates and uh, where we thought they were going, because uh, the reason we were all wrong was the breadth of foraging locations in the Western Indian Ocean. And in fact, we can conclude that uh, Biot is really a turtle nesting refuge for the whole of the Western Indian Ocean, so the MPA is playing a critical role in conservation of turtles. Um, so what I'm going to show you is an animation of the tracks that we've recorded so far. So it's 23 tracks, and we've only attached tags at Diego Garcia so far. So the red dot is Diego Garcia, and then you've got the boundary of the MPA here. 
And what you'll see is um, tracks which are divided into three different colors for 2012, 2015, and 2017 tag attachments. And uh, each of those tracks ends in a star, which is the foraging ground. So hopefully this is going to work. Okay. So you'll immediately see some stars appearing in the MPA itself. So we were really surprised at this um, because it was not formally known that green turtles were foraging in the Chagos Archipelago. And, um, and then um, most of the tracks were westward. We had one lone turtle that's migrated to Maldives, though watch this spot because we've just attached some more satellite tags and we've got another one that's headed further north than this turtle so far. Uh, about 40% of the tracks have ended in foraging sites across the Seychelles um, um, EEZ. And uh, we've recorded some really interesting um, tracks, such as this circuitous track and another one here. Um, and the, the broad kind of results are that we have, so far anyway, is that we've recorded record-breaking migrations up to 4,000 kilometers. Um, but it's a vast um, range of migration distance. So from only 70 kilometers for turtles to go to the Great Chagos Bank here, all the way to Somalia. So huge range in migration effort. And um, Biot is a nesting refuge for turtles from across the Western Indian Ocean. So it has huge value as a conservation area for, um, for green turtles, which are all represented here. And uh, we've been contributing to work um, by the British Indian Ocean Territory for their conservation management plan and to ensure that our results are integrated there. So of the turtles that didn't travel very far, so these five stars here, uh, we wanted to see if turtles could be used as habitat indicators. So he Heather mentioned this morning that they found a large area of seagrass in the western um, Great Chagos Bank in 2010. Uh, but the turtles that we tracked went to a completely different area. And so I had the opportunity in 2016 to do some surveys in that area, and this is what I found. So vast areas of the Lastendron ciliatum, so it, there's monospe monospecific seagrass meadow here. And this was at these two broad areas that we'd tracked turtles to. And lots of people didn't really believe me, so I just included this photo of myself <laughs> with the seagrass in the background because they, um, seagrass is a really unknown uh, kind of ecosystem in remote highlands of the Western Indian Ocean or the Indo-Pacific actually as a whole. So we're now working with seagrass ecologists to discover more about this really vitally important ecosystem. And uh, we're currently using drop-down cameras, so brev systems, uh, we're, we're very lucky that the SFPOs on board uh, the patrol vessel are helping us to um, drop down these video systems at additional sites, uh, and we're able to investigate the seagrass fish-associated community. We're finding that all of the fish communities are dominated by grey sharks at every single site, and that there's a real wide diversity of fish, um, fish families present. So, um, standing in a place where Charles Darwin um, stood once, um, 150 years ago, to give uh, one of his seminars, and uh, one of the points that he made was that there's how do turtles find their way to specks in the ocean? And it's a long-standing, unresolved mystery, and turtle biologists have been working on this uh, across the world. And our tracks and our data set is quite unique because we've been able to, we've uh, tracked turtles to very remote areas. So a lot of turtle tracking um, tracks turtles to a continental landmass or a large country where turtles face a bimodal choice in which direction to turn to once they hit the coastline. Um, but we've tracked turtles to tiny islands uh, which are really remote in the Seychelles, also in the Maldives and we're able to investigate their mo movements in more detail and look at whether um, turtles are... So it's believed that turtles are informed by a magne crude magnetic map in the first stages of their migration and then more localised cues, such as windborne cues. Uh, but we believe that 
It's a multimodal strategy that they're adopting, and uh, so we're investigating this further by use of our uh, data set. So you can see here, this yellow turtle actually bypassed its ultimate foraging ground by uh, 500 kilometers. Um, it then went past another really suitable foraging ground, which is Aldabra, uh, but then uh, stayed there for two days, ignored it, and then continued. So as well as uh, working on long-standing mysteries, we're working with, uh, collaborating with large groups to use our data set and add it to other larger data sets um, to answer some, or try and answer some common questions across taxa and look at commonalities movement patterns. So you can see our data set uh, is included in this recent publication here, which involved uh, many millions of locations. So we're, e we're able to add value to our data sets. And I think this is one of the real values of all coming here today and working together to um, build collaborations and use our own data uh, to combine it with others and uh, really add that much more. So just finally, a couple of slides on the work in at Turtle Cove in Jacob Garcia Lagoon. So a really special area. It's not often that you're able to have long-term data sets available. And Jean Mortimer set up a um, flipper tagging study in 1996 uh, in the lagoon. Um, she's now tagged um, over 100, well over 100, actually 200 turtles there. And we're able to understand more about their growth rates, their patterns of behavior, and whether or not they stay in this important developmental habitat for a long time, or um, they're just passing through. So um, most turtles are really small, like this one that I'm holding, not particularly photogenic, covered with epibionts. Uh, and it's been a fantastic citizen science project as well, where we're able to have hundreds of volunteers, such as this group, helping us. And we think this is a way that we're re really able to um, influence behavior on the islands um, in terms of um, attitudes and um, help with beach cleanups. So we've had a huge increase in numbers turning out for beach cleanups. Um, and then, uh, so for example, we we're able to look at the growth rate of turtles, the immature turtles, and, the, and a lot of the turtles have stayed for over 22 years now in the lagoon with really small, slow growth rates. And this is um, exceptionally important for long-term conservation. Um, it's a classic K strategist, um, really slow growth rates, very long time to come to maturity. So we're looking at turtles that um, are there in the lagoon for um, at least 20 years, and the protection of the lagoon and conservation is really critical to the survival of this um, species. So we've equipped a large number of adult green turtles so far. We're now going to turn to adult hawksbill turtles in the next expedition. And uh, we've started to tag the hawksbill and, gre and green immature turtles in the lagoon to find out where exactly they're, you, uh, they're going to in the lagoon and perhaps inform conservation policy there. Um, we've started with a number of publications since the project started, and we're hoping to keep the momentum going and work with others um, as we achieve more, hopefully. So just to leave on the acknowledgements, thank you to all the volunteers, um, our funders, the people at Biota that assist with the logistics, and, um, and of course the Bertarelli Foundation for being here today. Thank you very much.